안녕하세요. 안녕하세요. And things to do with sampling, so that we can save the costs of acquiring data relating to parking. But I think these technologies that we've developed have some uh, broader implications, particularly the second topic, much broader than just parking. So, what is parking data? Well, um, many parking garages have had sensors in them for some time. Um, but it's only been in the last 10 years or so that people have started to install the sensors in streets, as you can see on the far um, left from your point of view. Um, then the sensors often look like this with an electromagnetic capability. Um, and it's very important to keep track of which policies we use. We need maps to understand which streets are adjacent to which and where the sensors are, where the cars are parked. But we've also been trying to use much more cost-effective methods of collecting the data. For instance, we have cameras attached to cars, such as were used in the city of Berkeley. We have data from cell phones. And furthermore, we have data from parking meters. Now, you might think that you can tell exactly how many cars are parked in the street just by looking at the parking meters, but of course, not everybody pays, and sometimes they pay too much. They don't know how long they're going to stay. But as with many data processing problems, you can do a lot by fusing different kinds of data. For instance, we can use information from in-street sensors and couple it with data from payments in order to work out which spaces are occupied. There's a car there. Um, but are unpaid, in which case we can send enforcement officers. But we also use many other kinds of sophisticated data because we look at, say, traffic flow using inductive loop sensors. This is very important, say, to understand just how congested an area actually is because uh, parking congestion, um, even if a street is full, if there's nobody arriving and there's nobody flowing past, then it's not going to cause very much of a problem. Um, but if it's a very busy street, say like a motorway, an, an auto route, a highway, um, then very often you're not even allowed to park there because even just one vehicle trying to park can cause lots of problems. We've even worked with satellite data in, um, in conjunction with the University of California at Berkeley um, to understand pollution. And of course, we've used classical methods, for instance, surveys to understand how effective parking policies and parking projects are, as well as keeping track of special events so you can have special pricing for special events, but also so that these aren't seen as outliers, but that we can identify effectively data points with extreme parking conditions as outliers. So why do people bother collecting such data? There's three main use cases. Uh, firstly, people are interested in setting parking policy. It's not simply a question of prices, but there's this whole topic called demarcation, which says, should we paint lines around the spaces, or should we just leave the streets unpainted, and in that way we fit in more smaller cars? Um, as I mentioned earlier, it can be useful to guide enforcement officers, but perhaps most interestingly, um, you can provide guide, uh, driver assistance systems, ADAS, to guide drivers to the best vacancies and in future autonomous vehicles to those spaces. Overall, these uh, use cases can provide value in many different ways. Obviously, they can save people time wasted in finding a space. They can lead to considerably less pollution, in some cases with older vehicles, and therefore better health. It's not only the drivers that benefit. If your street is completely full in front of your shop or your local business, people can't park, and particularly in the US, they then don't come and visit you. Um, so it's very important to those citizens. And finally, and most interestingly, if we collect parking data rather than doing simple surveys, then we can arrive at a fair and transparent system. That is to say that many cities suffer from parking problems because politicians don't want to touch the parking problem because it's a div divisive issue, okay, nobody wants to pay more. Um, on the other hand, um, one knows that different streets and different times really have very different behaviors, 
And so one needs a quite heterogeneous and complicated answer if one really wants to optimize the system. And making that trade-off is very difficult for a, a high-level politician to do. Um, and that leads to a number of cities suffering from various areas being highly underutilized and other areas being heavily overused. Now, the challenge is to maximize the utility of the data. That's those values minus the cost of acquiring the data. And as I said earlier on, using in-street sensors can be rather expensive. Many cities have deployed such smart parking systems since 2010. For instance, San Francisco, London, Moscow. But we worked with three main cities um, where we deployed a number of different new technologies in red but we also deployed many other uh, machine learning technologies in the evaluation of the effectiveness. We've developed systems for forecasting and policies for real-time parking guidance. Um, but I won't have time to talk to you about all of these things today, only this uh, question of pricing and sampling. Um, and the work won our former company a number of rather prestigious awards, at least in terms of parking. So. Pricing, in LA, we had, in the early stage of the project, about 7,000 sensors shown by the little dots, distributed, covering nearly all of downtown Los Angeles, and a total of 3,000 prices, which sounds like rather a lot, but in fact, that's because each sensor had potentially four different prices, because we had carefully divided up the time of the week so that there were three different times of day during weekdays, Monday through Friday, and one particular price for weekend days. And clearly the idea is to move from a situation where one street, or even quite often one side of a street, can be congested. That is to say that over 90% of the spaces are occupied and you may have to drive um, 300 meters to find your closest space or, and then walk back. And then the other side might be underused. So what we want to do is to analyze the occupancy data and to come up with new prices so we have an ideal state, which is a, a trade-off between how many people are parked and getting value from being parked simply, and how far people have to drive to look for a space and walk back to their preferred walking destination. So to capture the problem a little bit more formal formally, we want to learn prices for on-street to make the city happier. That is, to maximize, in an economic sense, the rate at which people get value from the system. Now, it's important to emphasize that it's about value. It's not about revenue. Um, and in fact, we ended up decreasing 50% of LA's prices. Um, this, from a machine learning point of view, you might think that this is an exploration, exploitation trade-off, a kind of bandit problem or reinforcement learning problem. Um, which means that somehow we'd need a kind of model or a forecast for this concept of value. But it seems very difficult to come up with a model for value for parking. It's not the same as selling apples and oranges. And the reason is, while you can uh, change your frequency when you're buying apples and oranges, um, that is to say you can buy them every week or you could buy three every two weeks or you, it's difficult to, you can also change your location but here in parking you can also change exactly when you arrive like do you arrive um, at a cheaper time of day or a more expensive time of day you can change your duration you could stay chatting with your friends for 20 minutes after your gym class or only 10 minutes um, and furthermore there's a tremendous variation in what we call legality fraction that is, the fraction of time that people are parked for which they actually pay. Um, sometimes people often overpay. And at the same time as having this very complicated model, we want to ensure simplicity. Um, and this is very important because if less drivers can remember the parking, then they won't be able to adapt their behavior in any way. And furthermore, when city officials and politicians are asked about the project, they need to be able to explain it in a clear and concise way. Yet, we know that you need quite a complicated system um, if you are really to optimize things in a theoretical sense. Um, because we know that as you go from one side of a street to the other, or even along a very a long street, 
then there can be enormous variations. And it's also the case that early in the morning it might be very full, and then um, at uh, 10 minutes later it's, it's, it's empty, or if it's a residential street, or vice versa in, in a business street. So, how do we address this challenge? Well, as I said, the first thing we need is a model for the value from which people get um, from the system. Well, the simplest kind of model um, is the very simple observation that um, the more people there are parked, then the more people are getting value, but the distance that you have to travel, each new arrival has to travel to space, tends to increase. So in the simplest model, um, we can imagine that each of the parking spaces is an independent random variable, and we then have a geometric distribution along an infinitely long street. Um, and if, if a fraction f of the spaces are full, that we call the occupancy fraction, then um, the average distance to a space is given by this formula f over 1 minus f, uh, as it shows on the diagram on the right. But this is singular function as the occupancy fraction tends to 1. So it might not be a very useful model in practice. So why is it unrealistic? Well, clearly it's because occupancy fractions tend to vary considerably in space. Um, and you can measure that a little sort of statistical analysis of the spatial autocorrelation of occupancy fraction. What that means is that if you take two sensors or two parking spaces at a particular time of the week, um, and you compare their average occupancy fraction at that particular time of the week over many weeks, um, and you then do the same for many different pairs of sensors over distance, and you measure the correlation between them, then you can see that um, it's a kind of uh, semantic, not only are they related by distance, they're also related by semantics. So if we look at pairs of sensors on the same street in the black curve, they're highly related, but even if you're at the same distance of 100 meters, um, between a pair of parking spots, then you're considerably less related, shown by the, the red curve. And so, if you take a realistic measure of the mean distance based on the actual data um, to the first space, then it looks rather more like the red line um, shown on the left. Now, if you couple that with a simple constant valuation in expectation for each person that's parked, then you'll arrive at a curve like this. So the total valuation rate being this constant per person parked minus some other constant times the distance to be traveled per arrival. Now this other constant I've given k couples together very, very many different things. Um, it depends on the rate at which people are arriving because it's, um, and it also depends on things like people's value for time. Some people have very different values for time. Um, and so it could be rather difficult to choose, however, there's a general consensus amongst parking managers that the peak of this curve should be somewhere around 85% where people are traveling an average of about six spaces to find um, their preferred parking space and to find an available vacancy. Now, from a machine learning point of view, what we would do is to try to integrate this total valuation rate over some region of space and over some period of time um, and to maximize it, and the usual way of maximizing it um, is gradient ascent. This is very simple for machine learning scientists, but it's not at all simple for uh, citizens and parking officials. So, what if we were to maximize a simple approximation to that curve, like the red line shown here? Well, uh, that curve has an interesting property. Um, its slopes are only plus one, zero, or minus one. Okay, so there's only any contribution to a gradient when you're to the left half of that curve below 70% occupancy or to the right half of the curve when you're above 90% occupancy. So this leads to a very simple rule for, um, for parking which actually goes down very well in a, a very democratic place. Um, it's a voting rule, so you just measure the fraction of time that this system is over 90% full, and we call that a high vote, and the fraction of time that the system is under 70% full, and call that the low vote. And so if it's high much more often than it's low, then you would increase the price, and if it's low much more often than it's high, then you would decrease the price. This is simple enough for 
uh, citizens that really care to understand and it's simple enough, but actually maximizing that red curve is nearly the same as maximizing the black curve. And furthermore, even though it's very simple, it's rather different from what people have done before. So in, for instance, in the city of San Francisco and in other places, they used an average occupancy fraction rule. So they took an integral on average over time of the occupancy um, and they said that if this is too high, then they increase the price, and if it's too low, they need to decrease the price. But we know that this doesn't give you the best trade-offs. It's perfectly possible, as shown by these two scenarios, to have a street on the left where um, nothing much is happening. People aren't coming and people aren't going, so the occupancy fraction is constant at about two-thirds. And in other situations, it could be completely empty for the first hour of the morning, and then suddenly the occupancy shoots up. Um, and again, that's got an average occupancy of two-thirds, and so this San Francisco uh, average occupancy rule would predict the same price, whereas our rule would actually find that scenario A deserves a price decrease, which to uh, um, most people seems rather sensible because the average distance that you have to travel to a space is only two, whereas in the second scenario, the average um, number of uh, spaces you have to get past to find a vacancy is actually 11. Um, so even quite simple rules can lead to very different conclusions. So the question is, we deployed this in LA in 2012. Does it actually work? To understand whether it actually worked, we need to see what, uh, what actions this, this uh, algorithm actually came up with. Um, so on the left, I'm showing the uh, number of spaces and hours at a given price before the first price changes. Um, and on the right, I'm showing the, um, the number of spaces at a given hour um, in the period immediately following uh, the beginning of 2013. Now, what we can see here is that, in fact, 50% uh, of the prices actually uh, decreased. Um, strangely enough, uh, the revenue of the city increased by 12%. Um, there are different explanations for this. Part of it is because in the very, very underused areas, then people started coming back, um, which was good. Um, another part of it was there was an installation of credit card type of meters. And when you use credit card meters, then people usually don't have the excuse that they don't have the change. <laughs> so, um, th and they can furthermore pay for the right amount of time that they want. So does it work? Well, the simplest analysis uh, is to look at case by case. And here is one particular street. And what we show here is all the months um, as, as um, different um, uh, rows um, for different times of day. And uh, the color of each of the pixels is, represents the occupancy. So if the occupancy is 12, then we see it's red. And that means that the street had no vacancies at that time. Um, whereas green is like this ideal state and blue means it's underused. And we can see that there was a price increase um, at the end of September, excuse me, <coughs> um, from four to five dollars an hour. And you can see a clear improvement um, in the um, behavior of the system. The question is, is this because of the price change? But maybe it's because something happened to the sensors. Maybe it's a lucky coincidence that a shop happened to shut down at the time. Or is it something else? Who knows? Well, one way to answer those questions is to look at bigger scale aggregates. So here we look at all of the city over those periods, and we show the number of spaces that were congested in red at any given time of the day, um, both before and after the uh, sequence of price changes. Um, and we see that the number of congested spaces reduced by 10%, and the number that were underused, um, that is to say that at most 14 of their closest neighbors were occupied at any given time, was reduced by 5%. But this is, of course, only results from uh, quite early in the phases of the project. We only actually worked um, on the project until about that time uh, when it was taken over by our business groups uh, at the time. Um, since that time, what we find with regards to highly congested places is that a very large fraction of people, say in Los Angeles, use handicap placards. Um, and they, don't, they park for free, so pricing really has very little effect on them. Um, and many, you can actually buy on the internet an illegal handicap placard for about $30. And so in Los Angeles, people tend to do that. Um, there's therefore some pressure 
even from the handicapped groups, on politicians to get this law changed. Um, and this is happening, but it's taking time. Whereas in the places where we set the price to the minimum acceptable level that would just support the, um, the cost of maintaining the meters, then we found that prices actually, the occupancy continued to increase over that time. It's difficult to say why. Um, it could be because there's been economic improvement in the city over that time. It could be because um, people didn't really realize that the price had gone down. It took, there was a long latency in um, change for their behavior. Um, the good news is the political acceptance of the project that unlike uh, San Francisco, uh, which actually removed their census at the end of the project, then Los Angeles Express Park continues to receive positive press coverage and is continuing to expand today in areas such as Hollywood and Westwood. So that's the introduction to some of the work we did in pricing. Now let's talk about um, sampling, which is uh, more, uh, more of a, a technical question. And I want to, there was a very practical side to this, which we deployed in both Washington DC and, and in Berkeley. Um, but there's also a rather theoretical side, so I want to balance the talk with some theoretical material. Um, so there's so many different ways you can collect this occupancy data as shown in the diagram here. Um, but uh, what we really want to do is to choose the ones that will ensure high quality data while saving us 90% um, of the total costs. Um, one natural thing to do is to uh, measure only some of the parking spaces and use some kind of spatial interpolation and smoothing. Another is to sample in time. So, well, for instance, we have a car that drives down the street one day and doesn't go down the street the next day, or we have a camera stuck to a lamppost which moves from week to week. The question is, which streets should we measure? Some of them are more important than others. Some change their behavior more than others um, and different things. So from a more formal point of view, we could call this problem P1. Um, and the task is if we simply had a single time series that we wanted to keep track of, uh, which was normally distributed in discrete time, and that would correspond to this black line here, um, from which we receive some measurements. Those measurements given by the blue dots here, which come at a cost. They're not on the black line because they're noisy. Um, but we can use, say, a common filter or some other tracking mechanism to um, predict our uncertainty of our predictions of where that time series is. And so the question is, well, when should we uh, make those measurements so as to minimize the total cost of prediction errors plus measurement costs? Um, and I think that for those that are interested in the maths of it, then there's a formulation given on the side. You can probably already see that uh, this is actually a form of uh, partially observed Markov decision process. Um, and exactly solving such problems is known to be very challenging and there are very few special cases where the exact solution is known. Um, this problem occurs all over the place. So we've spoken about it in parking, where we could have a time series representing the occupancy of a block face, and we get measurements which are noisy from mobile cameras and less good quality measurements from payment data. It could be for the military where you're trying to uh, track the position of a submarine, and you get measurements from sonar. It could be in the context of telecommunications where in 5G, people would like to, tr to beam signals to a handset, and so they need to be able to, um, to, to track the position of that handset, but they maybe uh, don't want to use too much power to achieve that. It's also rather a fundamental machine learning problem in the sense that it addresses the basic trade-off between the costs of data acquisition and the costs due to errors because of a lack of data in a particularly simple way. And for those that are interested in control theory, it turns out that we could solve, um, if we solve this problem P1, an optimal control problem, then we could solve a, a linear quadratic Gaussian problem with costly measurements, which is um, an, a, a long-standing open problem in control theory posed by NASA scientists in the 1960s. Now, uh, more recently, people have conjectured a very simple form for the solution to problem P1 which says we should make a measurement, a costly measurement, only if our uncertainty exceeds a threshold. 
So what we do is we let the system evolve and evolve and our uncertainty window grows and grows and when it gets too big, we observe. Very simple. But is that right? How can we tell? Um, another reason why it's interesting, which was exact, actually our uh, original objective, um, our motivation for studying the problem is if you have several time series, n of them, like these streets shown here, um, and you've got more than one sensor, um, but the number of sensors is less, so you might have four cameras observing 800 different streets in Washington, D.C. Which time series should you look at at each time? Particularly if some are somehow more important than others. They affect more people than others, say. Now, the trouble with this problem is it looks rather hard. Um, it's got a state space with real valued with n dimensions. In this case, it would be 800. Um, and there are a number of actions the, which correspond to the choices of m things out of n. Nevertheless, there was a very simple policy for this problem proposed in the 1980s by Peter Whittle from Cambridge. Um, and it seems to work well, as I can demonstrate on the next slide, but in order to be sure that we're applying that policy, then we must first of all solve problem P1. So I claim then that if we solve P1 in a threshold policy, then we do much better than simple policies. So here I consider a problem of tracking 10 time series with only one sensor, where time series one is 40 times more important than the others. Now, there are several things we could do. Um, in radar tracking, people often use a myopic policy, which observes at each time the one time series, or one of the one time series with the largest weighted predicted variance. And alternatively, we could just say, keep it simple um, and observe one, two, three, four, five, and so on, and loop one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Whereas if we use Whittle's policy, we can see that the total tracking cost in this scenario is dramatically lower um, than those other policies. It's even less than half the cost of the simple myopic policy. So it's a highly effective method for processing this problem. So the solution to the problem, we recent, we published part of this at NIPS um, two years ago, um, and we submitted a really rather full solution to JMLR this year, Journal of Machine Learning Research. So indeed, we demonstrate that the threshold policy is optimal for solving problem P1. But before we've been talking about predictive uncertainty, predictive variance, it turns out that we can show that this also works for many other desirable cost functions or loss functions, such as um, minimum predictive entropy or maximum predictive precision. And furthermore, we can show that there's an algorithm which can approximate the threshold to some accuracy epsilon um, in, in polynomial time in, in terms of the number of, uh, of, of bits of accuracy that we want to achieve. Um, now, of course, I can't go into details about the long proof, but the, the key idea behind it may be of some other independent interest because what we're seeing here is um, what we call a map with a gap as I will explain um, and to understand the behavior of a system which is governed by a map with a gap has many interesting uses so so we have a system at time t which is x sub t which corresponds to the predictive variance our uncertainty about the time series we're tracking and its dynamics are given by a common filter um, and there are two types of common filter updates that we could make. We could make one that corresponds to a, a noisy or poor or even no observation, phi zero, or one that corresponds to a good observation which comes at a cost phi one. So what happens to our system uh, when we apply our threshold policy with a threshold z? Well, the, the state xt plus one, uh, the next time is either phi zero if we're below the threshold, xt is less than z, or phi one of xt if we're above the threshold. And this corresponds to the mapping shown on the right. So it could be we start off from point A, um, and then we apply phi zero, it takes us to point B, but then we're above the threshold, so we apply phi one, and we're still above the threshold, so we apply phi one again, and then we get to point D, and so on and so forth. And we get a sequence of actions, zeros and ones. And understanding that sequence of actions is, is the key question that you need to resolve in order to prove this. Now, people th may think that uh, mathematicians and people doing dynamical systems have been studying such iterated function systems for a long time. 
Um, but actually, they've mainly been doing this when the function f is smooth and nicely differentiable. But our function is discontinuous. Yeah? So what happens then? Well, it's rather important to try to understand because if you have switching in electrical circuits, uh, neural spiking behavior where things build up and then go through some threshold behavior, even gene regulatory networks, then you get models which can be described by this. So to, to look at it um, pictorially, graphically, then as you change the threshold, then you get action sequences that are shown like this black diagram here. So if you have a very low threshold, you're going to do lots and lots of observation. So there's lots and lots of white in the first column. But if you have a very high threshold, you're hardly going to observe at all. And these, um, these sequences can't be exactly periodic. This is a discrete time thing. But they're nearly periodic. So what kind of sequence or infinite sequence on an alphabet 0, 1? Or what kind of infinite word is this map generating? Well, the answer is, in fact, you're seeing it on the computer screen um, every time you look at a computer screen. It's exactly what you get when you draw a digital straight line, like the Bresenham algorithm, um, as shown on the, the right here. If we tried to draw a line with a slope of 3 sevenths, then um, the sequence of gradients of the digital straight line will be 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. Um, and this is called a mechanical word. Now, in terms of uh, mechanical words, it's been known for some time, uh, 2003, rather general conditions under which nonlinear maps with a gap, like the one given by our common filter, generate such words. But what one really needs to understand this problem is to know which thresholds generate which of those mechanical words. And this was rather recently discovered for the context of when the two parts of the map are both linear. Um, but what we've done is to extend that with nonlinear maps. Um, and so this work um, can potentially be useful in a number of other contexts. But of course, we have to uh, be honest about how far we could go. And uh, uh, we, we don't know what happens if there's more than two types of measurement. Maybe there's a, um, a, a good measurement, a bad measurement, and an amado measurement. I, I don't know. Maybe. Um, and, and then what happens if there's more than just a scalar time series? We have multiple components. And furthermore, most real-world time series are indeed uh, non-Gaussian, um, and that's rather important. So if we look forward in this... Uh, context of uh, machine learning for parking, there's lots of interesting questions still to be resolved. Um, not only in parking, but uh, we, we've shown that demand management technologies can make a lot of sense in the context of parking. It could be applied in many, many other cases. Um, and it seems that we can save tremendous amounts on the cost by using computer vision technologies, but there's a lot of room for improvement um, in counting the number of cars on a street. Um, for instance, even if you uh, detect that a, a space is actually occupied 95% of the time, then um, if you want to detect that a whole street is occupied, <laughs> then it, it could well be that um, the street has seven cars, and then you only detect a true full street 50% um, of the time or 60% of the time. Um, then there's this whole question of non-demarcated parking, where there's no lines painted around the spaces. So there, using sensors in the street can be very difficult because you get cars that are sort of half parked over the sensor. And um, when, when, what should you say then? Um, and 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 you could well have systems where you have, can have 10 short cars parked at some time, or only um, uh, only three or four large trucks. Um, so. Forecasting such systems seems to be rather difficult. And perhaps most interestingly, then we've got this opportunity to explore um, parking policy, parking guidance for autonomous vehicles. Now, on the one hand, uh, because these vehicles are autonomous, then uh, there's the opportunity for uh, more effective because they're more complicated mechanisms, for instance, uh, coming up with policies for routing the thing for the vehicles, um, for making reservations for spaces, for um, having options, um, as one often has in a financial context. But if you're not sure you're going to park somewhere, you may well find it useful to have an option so that you tell the system some useful information, even lotteries. But 
as you make these things more complicated, um, you're not going to end up making life simpler for citizens, particularly as we will be living in a mixed world where some people will be driving autonomous vehicles and others um, will be um, in maybe only having ADAS type of systems. So that was my introduction to our past work on, um, on painless parking. Thank you very much. <laughs>